great. Great to see you uh, this very day. Uh, welcome to Hope City. It's another day that the Lord has made. We are going to rejoice and be glad in this day. Let me pray before we proceed. Dear Heavenly Father, I give you honor for this very day. Mighty God, I pray that you speak to us in this day. Let this word, Almighty God, change, transform us so that we can bear fruits for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome to Hope City, Tanzania. My name is Pastor Morris. And uh, we are told by our team, as we are proceeding, they are getting ready to uh, go live so that we can minister to everyone who is watching us, those who are here and those who are watching us. So last week, we, uh, we had a great time in the house of the Lord. Uh, I had my son say my preach. He was asking for so long that I want to preach, I want to preach. And then we uh, had an opportunity for him to pray. Uh, today I was like, okay, Dad, you're going to be praying for Dad before he preach. So he came back there and he prayed for me. And he's getting ready. He was talking to teacher Esther. Like, next week I'm going to preach uh, for Hope City Kids. So, and then he's telling everybody, call me Pastor and Dad. So I guess that is, that is what he's going to go for. He was... Looking forward to be a scientist and artist. I was like, so you're going to be pastor, scientist, artist, Daishima, you know? So we are thankful, though, that they are imitating what they see. That is our prayer. That is our prayer that our kids will imitate and will be uh, not only like us, but they will go farther. They will go farther and they will do great things in the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. I don't know if we are ready, Joshua. Not yet? Okay. I will continue then. Uh, this day, I just want to talk about a troubled heart. If you're writing down, you can write a cure for a troubled heart. Or you can write an antidote for a troubled heart. And this is not your heart or my heart. The flesh heart. No, no, no. This is our spiritual heart. So if you're writing down, it's an antidote. I don't know if those who are scientists, Nima, an antidote and cure is almost the same thing, right? Yes. So an antidote for a troubled heart. A cure for a troubled heart. See, Trust, trust is the foundation of all human connections, all human connections. I'll give you a very, I'll give you a very, very simple example. And you've heard me say this before. If you have an appointment with someone, you will agree that we will meet at Shoppers Plaza Mikocheni at 10 a.m. You will wake up in the morning. Get ready, get your breakfast. If you're driving, you'll get in your car on 9. Like me in Sala Sala, my estimations of driving towards uh, Shoppers is approximately maybe 30 minutes to 45 minutes. I'll start driving. Not knowing the person that we agree to meet, he is there. But I will go because I trust what they say to me. So I say trust is the foundation of all human connections. It's a, from chance of encounters to friendship and intimate relationships. Another thing, trust. You meet a girl, you meet a boy, you talk, I like you, I like you, you're cute, you're handsome, you go out, you eat dinner, and then it's like I want to get married to you, and she say yes, and you start those plans and everything else. You trust that person will show up at church. You are not sure. You can read their mind, but you are definitely sure that they will show up at church. For those who are married, 
we took a step of faith. You order the suits and everything, knowing that they will show up at church. Why? Because we trust them. I'm going to ask anybody with a phone, please. I need somebody to record this because I'm, I don't want to miss it. It's good? Okay, thank you so much. So that is trust. I'll give you an example of a child. When Rumisha was younger, he did not want anybody to carry him outside of our house. When the guest came come inside us, our house, he was okay. He would go to this person and that person and that person. Once we get outside of the house, he wanted only the parents. Why? He was familiar with us. And he knew we will provide protection and anything that he needs. Therefore, this course or sermon during Jesus' ministry. I'll go through them real quick. The first discourse or sermon or speech was a sermon on the mount in the book of Matthew 6 to 7. The second discourse or second sermon was the kingdom parable that is in Matthew 13. The third discourse or sermon, they call it the Olivet, the end of all things sermon at Mount Olivet. Matthew 24 and Luke 13. Now, the fourth discourse or speech was the upper room discourse. This is the longest of all of them. And it's from the book of John 13, 14, 15, and 16. We will talk about the fourth discourse or the sermon. But this sermon is different because this sermon is private. It is not public. It was reserved for the 12, a private sermon for disciples. And at this very moment, the book of Luke 22, 19 to 20, talks about the commotion that it was in this private dinner, so to speak. Jesus took bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it. In pieces and gave it to disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. Jump into uh, verse 24. They began to argue among themselves about who will be greatest among them in the kingdom of God. Now, they were thinking about the kingdom of God here on earth. Mind you, this is only Roughly 20 hours before Jesus is cru crucified. Few hours before he's arrested. All chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, John has compiled them together within a period of 24 hours, so to speak. Now we are jumping to our text in the book of John 14.1. Jesus is saying this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. This scripture, sometimes we hear this scripture at funeral, most of the time. But why Jesus was telling his disciples in this private dinner, let not your hearts be troubled. In other words, he's saying, do not allow yourself to be agitated, to be frustrated. Why? In Luke, they are arguing who's going to be in higher position in kingdom of Christ. Once he overthrow Romans, that's what they were, they were thinking that way. He's going to overthrow Romans and I'm going to have a bigger position in your kingdom. And he was like, no, no, stop thinking about that. And he started to open about what's going to happen. If you read the book of John 13... He unveiled or he told about Judas. Someone among you is going to betray me. Judah left after Jesus gave him bread. And then he continued to tell Peter. Peter, you're going to betray, to, be, to, uh, to deny me. So disciples are confused. 
who is going to betray you? Why is Peter going to deny you? And what are you talking about death? What are we going to do? At this very moment, everything about their livelihood is tied into Jesus. They left everything and they are following Jesus at this moment. They are thinking about their business they left, their work they left. Some of them, they are living far away from their families. Some of them, they are thinking about, man, I did not build my house. I wish I knew and buy me a house somewhere and start my business. And they are confused. Jesus, what's going to happen? Everything is going to go away from us. Not only that, they are afraid of retaliation from religious Sadducees and the Jews who didn't like him. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. And I will tell you how you're going to do that. Because when you read this one verse, it's like, oh, pastor, okay, you read from the Bible, but my situation is different. How am I going to not let my heart be troubled? You do not know my situation at this very moment. My family is in shambles. We don't get along in my family. You have no idea where I am in my life at this moment. Everything seems to go away. But he says, do not let your heart be troubled. In other words, Jesus is telling them this. They are looking at themselves and they are looking at Jesus. They are looking at their ability and they are looking at the ability of Jesus. In their mind, they are thinking, man, Jesus is more than a prophet. How are we going to do what he did? Are we, not gonna bo- we are not going to be able to preach like he did. We are not eloquent like Jesus. We cannot heal the sick. Forget about healing the sick. We cannot raise the dead. How are we going to go ahead and reach out the community? So Jesus is looking at them, perturbed, confused, agitated, frustrated, and he say, do not. Let your heart be troubled. It's like an introduction of something that will relieve you. Do not let your heart be troubled. In other words, he's is telling them, stop thinking that way. Don't degrade yourself. Don't underestimate yourself. Don't undervalue. Don't despise or overlook yourself. That which is inside me is in you. The power you see operating in my ministry resides in you. But one thing that he says caught my attention. Don't let your heart be troubled. That is a command. And when Jesus gives command, he gives you way and capability of Fulfilling that command. In other words, also when he gives you a command, it shows that we are in control of our emotions. We together. When he tells you do not let your heart be troubled, that means he knows you can stop your heart from being troubled. When he gives his command, he gives you capability of fulfilling his command. You will be like, Pastor, how? How am I going to apply this scripture? How in my life? It's so easy to say, do not let your heart be troubled. Thank you for that question. Because Jesus is the answer. And we're going to see what he says. He gave us three things. Or three reasons. And we are, we, that we can apply them in our lives. Number one is of because of who you know. If you're writing down. Because of who you know. This is what he said. Do not let your heart be troubled. He didn't end up there. He said, believe in God, also believe in me. Or trust in God and trust in me. At this very moment, did they have any reason not to trust in Jesus? Has he been trustworthy in their lives? Absolutely he was. Right? 
When there was no food for multitude, Jesus fed the multitude. When the storm overwhelmed the boat, Jesus calmed the storm. When Lazarus died, Jesus raised him to life. That's awesome. That's amazing. But why are they afraid? Why are they agitated? And they know who Jesus is. So he introduced himself because of, you know, with his miracle. If you keep reading, he says, you will do even greater miracle than my miracles. But he did not end up there. Number two, if you're writing down, because of where you will go. We will stay over here. Because of where you will go. He continues to say, in my father's house are many places to live. If there weren't, I would have told you so. Because I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Now, I don't want you to be agitated. I don't want you to be pursued. I don't want you to be frustrated. Because where you're going, man, it's going to be amazing. The place that you are is permanent. But you are going somewhere. He is saying, yes, you've seen me raise the dead. You've seen me feed the thousand. But you are still agitated. You are still perturbed. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. Where I am going after my death, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If you read the book of Revelation 21, 1 to 3, the word of God says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold! The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. In my father's house are many places. In other translations say in my father's house are many mansions. But we read the, uh, the original language it says places all rooms. In accurate translation, we'll say apartments. In my house, in my father's house, are many places. In other words, he's saying this. If I can have uh, the, the, the young people that are ready for, for the example. In other words, he's saying this. Don't be distracted by a temporary situation. No, don't let your temporary situation distract you from your destination what is happening is real your frustration are legitimately your issues in life are legitimately everything that is going in your life right now it is true but that which is troubling you is temporary where you are going is permanent don't let what is temporary discourage you don't let what is temporary Remove your focus to what is permanent. He says, a piece of land in heaven for you. Now, listen. I don't know, I don't know if you know a piece of land in heaven is how much. This is what Jesus is saying. These things, maybe if this is relationship. Maybe if this is your work. Maybe if this is your, is your marriage. Don't worry about these things. These things will pass away. You might be here for 20 years. You might be here for 70 years. You might be here for maybe 80 years. I may give, even give you 90 years. But you're going to live this year. And you will go to a new place. A new heaven. A new earth. And this will pass away. Let me tell you something. I grew up. I grew up in Kinondoni. Uswailini. Right? But I went to school in Oster Bay. Oster Bay is a beautiful place. I don't know if you've been there, but it's a nice place. So every time I walk from Kinondoni, Uswailini, to Oster Bay. And then I had few friends of mine who live in Oster Bay. 
Now, mind you, those houses back then in Holster Bay, they were built by German and British. Nice house. Everything in the house is not from China. It's from England. It's from German. The sinks, the tiles, the doors, everything was different. So I used to go over there and I'm like, man, this place is nice. And then I'll come back at Kinondon. So I leave. And then I'll go back to Masaki. I'm like, man, this place is nice. And then I went to the States. And I was like, man, they got bigger buildings in the United States. And then we came back to Tanzania. Our friend from the States came to Tanzania. And they're like, hey, listen, man, I'm going to take you to a nice place in Tanzania. So we took them to Osterbe and Masaki. And they were like, wow, now I can live in this place. Now think about this. These are people who are living in the United States. Not only in the United States, they are coming from affluent neighborhoods. So they went over there. They loved it. I love it. This is beautiful. But God is saying this. I am preparing a place for you. Not in Masaki. Not in UAE, Dubai. Not in London. Not in United States. This is place in heaven. You have a piece of land in heaven. You have your apartment in heaven. Yes, you are going through pain. Yes, you are going through diseases. Yes, you are frustrated. This is temporary. Where you are going is permanent. Forget about what it is over here. Now, let me tell you something. He was telling this to them, knowing that they will go through horrible life. Eleven of them, ten to be exact, they were murdered. Peter, upside down. John, he was tortured and he didn't die. They throw him in the island of Patmos. Judas committed suicide. All of them died in painful death. But he told them, listen man, this earth is rough. And in the same meeting, if you continue to read in the book of John 16.33, he said, in this world, you have tribulations. See, it's so hard for us pastor, to preach the reality of life. Most of the time, we want to come over and tell, hey, man, if I pray for you, hey, you're going to have a Mercedes Benz. If I pray for you, you're going to have twins. If I pray for who? you, you'll have promotion. If I pray for you, man, your business will expand. Yes, maybe, but sometimes not. And God knows why we don't have, we do not have all the answers. One thing I know, he is preparing a place for me. Whether I have everything here on earth or not, I know where I'm going. Listen, at this very moment, if you ask me, Pastor Morris, are you going to have a place in Masaki? I don't know. I don't think so. Do I want? Mm, not, th not that much. After reading this scripture, no. I'm content with Mbweni. I'm good. Where, 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 where we are trying to move, I'm good with it. I want to go to heaven to get a piece of property in heaven. A real estate property for Maurice Swai in heaven. Where my father lives. Praise the Lord. It's a funny thing when you read the Bible and you find some stuff that you've never seen before. Because John, in the book of Revelation, he wanted to know the dimension of New Jerusalem. And these are the dimension of New Jerusalem. The word of God says, the base has dimension of about 2,200 kilometers by 2,200 kilometers. That is about 2.2 million square miles. For those who are doing numbers, I think you're good. But there is an, a scientist who looked at these estimations and he said this. He said, the city of this size can occupy, can it be occupied by 20, 20 billion inhabitants. And he said this, and that is only 25% of designated for dwelling places. Why, why am I telling you all this stuff? Just to let you know that where you are at this very moment, the enemy is preaching to you that you are not good. Like the disciples. What you're doing doesn't matter. Your prayers will not be answered. Your situation will not change. I'm here to tell you, do not listen to what he is saying to you. 
It might be hard and tough, and you might be crying sometimes at night, but know this. There is a place for you. Don't let your heart trouble you. Believe in God. Believe also in Jesus. This is not our final destination. Praise the Lord. What Jesus is saying is this. When those feelings of failure, when those feelings of being overwhelmed are coming, when we see that our hearts are overwhelmed, frustrated, he is saying this. That should be the time to trust in him. That should be the time to lean on him. That should be the time to learn from God. That should be the time to be anchored in his word. In his house, there are many places. And he is going to prepare a place for us. And he said he is going to prepare a place for us. And he will come to get us for himself. I love it when he say that. Jesus will go prepare a place for us. And he will come to get us for himself. In other words, he says this. That I will go to heaven. And if we are going by or we are arriving by the airport or what, I don't understand. I don't know. But once we arrive... Himself will come to receive us. Have you seen those signs when you arrive at the airport? And the people with Uber and, and those cars are waiting for guests. And they have signs with the names on it. Have you seen it? That, that is what it will be. It will be like this. Jesus will be like this. Let's, let's see. Uh-oh. Uh -huh. I don't know if you can see this. And Jesus will be like, where? Where, where is, where's John and Jen? Oh, yeah, okay, okay. Next. Huh? He is receiving for yourself. For himself, he is showing you, hey, you are here. Faithful servant. Come. That is your place. I'm going to wipe away your tears. Troubles are over. You are in heaven. He will receive you, Elizabeth Song. I don't know who else in this list. He will receive you, Joyce. I don't know who this is. He will, hey, everybody's here. Nima. Everybody. I like it. He will receive us by himself. The devil is a lie. They are with Jesus. They have seen Jesus. Think about Peter. I believe Jesus was talking with them. And he was like, Peter, even you. I just heal your mother-in-law. And why are you frustrated? See, when we are frustrated sometimes, it's not like Jesus has not done anything in our lives. We have seen him. He has healed us. He has blessed us. He has forgiven us. But mm, we want more. And what do we want? Material stuff. What we want, tangible things. What we want, things that they have. Do we want things of the kingdom? Nah, so much. That's why he was redirecting their focus. Hey Amen. Listen, my kingdom is not here. I'm not gonna do nothing with Romans. The only thing he said, he said, the prince of this world is coming. He has nothing on me. He was warning them about spiritual warfare. Once I leave, you have spiritual warfare. I have overcome the world. He has nothing on me. He is assuring them victory after victory after victory after victory. What is going on in your life is real. I am not here to diminish the pain in your life. I am not here to tell you what's going on in your life is not horror. But don't let that remove the focus to your destination. Don't let that remove your, your eyes on Jesus and everything that he has done. Don't let that sway you from the goodness of God. Don't let that sway you from praying and seeking God because we are going to heaven anyways. Praise the Lord. 
Number two, because of where we will go. Number three, because of what he will show. He say, and where I go, you know. And the way you know, and, and, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. But Thomas was like, Lord, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? I love Thomas. Thomas is very open. Thomas is like me in math class. See, everybody was quiet when Jesus was saying, you guys know, and you know the way. Everybody's quiet. Thomas said, nah, mm-mm. Uh-uh. That part, Jesus, no, I didn't get that part. He was very honest. He was brutal honest. He was like, Jesus, no, I don't know where you're going. Would you please let me know where you're going? This led to one of the profound statements in the Bible. And Jesus was like, okay, what? You know what, Tom? And this is what's going to happen. You are looking at the way right here. You are looking at the truth right here. You are looking at the life right here. Let me tell you something. Don't be know-it-all Christian. If you don't know, be like, Jesus, I don't know what you said over there. Jesus, this scripture right here, I don't, I don't get it. Jesus, my situation over here is kind of fuzzy. I don't, I don't understand it. Don't pretend to Jesus that you know everything because he knows that you don't know. Be like Peter. Hey, Jesus, right here, I don't get it. And he's like, yeah, I understand you don't. I am the way. That was a tricky statement for Jesus. <laughs> and where I go, you know. And he knows they don't know. And the way you know. And he knows they don't know. But he wanted to see their heart. Are they going to be curious? Are they going to be honest? And Jesus like, waiting. And he's like, yeah. I think I don't know that, Jesus. I, I, I haven't got that one. Yes, I have my theology degree, but some things are kind of dark. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Why you should not let your heart be troubled? What is the reason? If like, Pastor, why? Sometimes it's okay to process pain, Pastor. They, they told me, psychologists, I have to process it. I have to listen to my heart. That's what they say. They have listened to my heart, and I'm going to let it go and let God. No, don't let your heart be troubled. Because, because a troubled heart, a troubled heart will not help us in our difficulties or out of them. A doubting, fretful spirit takes from us the joy that we have. A troubled heart makes that which is bad worse. Unbelief will magnify our difficulties. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. Revelation 21.4, the word of God says this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and the death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, no crying, no pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. I want to encourage you this day. I want to encourage you this day. Whenever you go through trials, whenever you go through tribulation, whenever you go through difficult circumstances, circumstances, whenever you get this diagnosis from the doctors that confuses you and you don't know if that's the end or not, know one thing. Everything that you see here on earth is temporary. Everything that you touch here on earth is temporary. Don't let what is temporary distract you from your destination. Do not let your heart be troubled as the present worship were coming. It is an encouraging word for me. And this is the moment that Jesus was not even fired up to speak. He was sitting with them in intimate session, probably having dinner, and he's trying to look and peel their eyes and their, their emotions. Because these people are feeling that he is leaving us. We're going to be by ourselves. And that is our lives sometimes. We believe or we feel like Jesus is nowhere to be found. 
We can't feel, we can't sense Jesus. We've prayed, but we don't see the answers. We don't hear him. He's quiet somewhere. He's still saying, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe in Jesus. Believe in God and believe in Jesus. Don't let what is temporary distract you from your destination. That is the cure for a troubled heart. 